So my talk is mainly about the European perspective on MOOCs. So what's happening in Europe <coughs> and why are we different from the US? And in what aspect are we different from the US? <laughs> and I don't know all the answers, but there are some data we collected on that. But first, let me introduce you. One moment. Yeah. To either to you, just some background information. Uh, there's a European Association on Distant Teaching Universities. It's already established in 1987. Uh, and DCU is a member of it, like the Open University in the UK, etc. Uh, this is about the coverage we have in Europe. There's a lacking coverage in Eastern Europe and Sweden, Finland. Uh, but we are pretty much a European coverage association on online distance and teaching universities. It's mainly um, open universities, but in many countries there are not an open university, like in France, and therefore there's a national association on, on uh, 37 uh, universities working on online and distance education. So not only distance education in correspondence, but also in online education and MOOCs, etc. Um, we have a lot of services for, for, uh, for our members, but also services for non-members. Uh, I mentioned here three of them. Empowering is in helping and working together with research universities in their transition to online education. So it's not only for members. We are working together with all kinds of regular universities in the transition to open and online education. We have an e-excellence that is a quality label on uh, e-learning, on online learning. And we have an open pad initiative on MOOCs. I won't talk a lot about OpenEPET. Here are some slides in your uh, kit for the conference itself. It has some flyer itself. OpenEPET is not a platform. There's a lot of talk about MOOCs on platform. Let me choose Coursera, edX, uh, FutureLearn, etc. This is about a non-profit partnership. So a kind of alliance with a certain branding. And the branding is related to the opening up of education for all. So it's related to removing the barriers for learners. And therefore also we have a quality label, the first one already launched last year, a uh, quality label for MOOCs, but it position MOOCs related to an official course, related to that branding of, of opening up education. One essential part if you're removing barriers is that you not only provide knowledge, for higher, van, of out of the higher education system for free in MOOCs, but also provide access by formal exams. So it's not only a MOOC that you can have access to the knowledge of a professor, but you can have also the opportunity to select a certificate of participation, or even only a certificate of uh, completion, but also a real certificate that counts towards a bachelor or master degree. So we are also working on that kind. The quality label is also published in an international journal. Uh, it will be on the slides as well, so you can look it up, etc. But my main issue so, is about the domination of the US and the MOOC market. Or is it not dominated by the US? If you look at it, it started in Canada, dominated as generally already in 2011 by the US. The main MOOC providers are edX, Coursera, Udacity. And what's happened in Europe? Most of the universities joined the American platforms. So we are handling over our course, our course content to the American platforms. Then already, and then as FutureLearn for example started in, two, in October 2013, there have become European platforms. But the European platforms are related to language or even country level. So there is no European platform. There's FutureLearn, based on the English language. There's MiriaDAX, based on the Spanish language. There's FUN, based on OpenEdX, it's a French language. Diversity, mainly German. So, diversity in Europe, not one platform. There's Perhaps some discussion, uh, Mike already stressed it, uh, Moodle is not suitable as a, Mo as a MOOC platform because it's not scalable to 10,000, 100,000 students. They say they are working on that and Moodle is multilingual, so that might become a platform that can be used in many universities because it supports also multilanguage. 
There's another issue is that an, there's a European funded project called EMMA and they are also working on a European platform. I'm not that satisfied myself with the platform. They're working on translation services as well. So there are some efforts on working on a European platform. And last but not least, you see governmental invol involvement in the MOOC world in Europe. FUN, Frédéric Université Numérique in France, is one example led by the French government. And it will be going down to a collaboration of universities in 2015, but still funded by the French government. This initiative in opening up Slovenia. Two weeks, two weeks before it was opening up Romania as a governmental aspect. There's uh, some aspects in Poland as well, in Norway, in the Netherlands, where governmental aspects are important in governmental involvement and funding is there for MOOCs and open education. Then the European Commission has this program opening up education. So it's not open education, opening up education as a verb. And it's about innovative teaching and re reshaping, modernizing the European agenda by using open educational resources and other means of open education. And they get a lot of funding of MOOC projects as well. So you see here the locos of uh, the, the MOOC projects now running by funding of the European Commission. I'm coordinating two of them, SCORE 2020 and HOME. Uh, I already talked about EMMA, making an, uh, an European platform with translation services. ECHO is another large project with uh, more, almost 3 million uh, funding um, that's making an, uh, a lot of effort in the social seamless kind of MOOCs, so the S MOOCs they call it, and making efforts to teachers, so helping teachers to create MOOCs. Then you went, recently there is TRAMOOC, it's just started as a Horizon 2020 project. Locomotion project is just started and I think that someone will talk about it uh, here as well. Yeah, this afternoon. Uh, I missed one that was a fairly early one, that's the MOOCs for web talent. There's a flyer on that in your, in your conference aspect, it's not on this slide. And I think that we are now with 11, 12 projects that are funded by the European Commission. Again, diversity and hardly any integration. I tried to work to, to this 11 project to integrate them. What kind of services are you developing? What will be their after project lifetime to make it more sustainable? To make it coherent? But that's a lot of effort. So this is an, an overview. It's a little bit outdated. For example, Coursera at the top has now more than 1,000 courses. Future Learn is there as well. It has more than 46. I think it's now more than 58, I think, about kind of courses. But you see, it's dominated by Coursera at X. Open Ed has also a lot of courses, but that's not a platform. That's a collection of universities working together and having their own platform. So not outsourcing your courses on the MOOC to another platform, but having your own platform. And the languages that are related to, etc. If you look at the amount of money going in, in the MOOC world, then looking at the three American one, Coursera, and perhaps that's more now, I did that analysis uh, almost five months ago, the funding is 58 million dollars. If you look at Udacity, 55. And Udem, Udacity, uh, Udemy is about 48. So there's a lot of money of investors in MOOCs itself. Not that we have a sustainable business model, but there's a lot of investment and a lot of trust by private companies in investing in these kind of platforms, etc. In Europe you see a different kind of thing. Governments are investing, European Commission are investing, not private companies. Governments and the European Commission. So that's one difference that will come back later on why. If you see for the business model, like for example this Coursera, what did Coursera do? They tried to do headhunting. So providing MOOCs, giving access, 
to, for, for companies and look for the best students and then headhunting them for, for a job. Didn't work quite well. What did work was about some kind of verified signature track. So that you as a person are authenticated and verified as the one who completed the course. And then offering some kind of specialization and now lately the capstone project. I won't talk about a lot. It seems to work. And perhaps they are now working on employee training and course sponsorship, so sponsorship within the course, etc. The estimated revenue is 8 to 10 million in 2014. Look at the number of money invested. It was 88, 85 million. So it's about that. And the universities get some share of the total revenues. But there is the other side. This was I think last week, in the, the link is in blue there on the head, hatching report, um, the University of California, it, it was a failure about their MOOCs and online education. So, there's another one in Chronicle Higher Education based on the Babson uh, survey report, and they say in the United States the MOOC hype is fading. So what's happening? We see on the surface all kinds of platforms, all kinds of money, but what is beneath the surface? What is there? The struggle, the diversity. Uh, what is the US indeed leading? What are the reasons to be involved? And what are the differences between the US and Europe? So I already said that there are some differences. I will come to that later. To provide some data, there is uh, one survey already done in the United States uh, a lot of times. It's done, it's now the latest, it's great level. Uh, they already do that an online survey, an online survey to online learning and e-learning since 2002. So it's about a long-term survey already. And the latest in the 2015 <coughs> is reporting about the, the data and the trends in 2014. In Europe, we don't have that kind of data and kind of survey. The AOA started with a survey on e-learning. They did it at the end of 2013 and reported it on last November. And what I did with my project partners in the home project was, and it's in this report as well, uh, it's in, in, in the copy on your, your brochure as well. You can look at it, it's online available a report on the institutional MOOC strategies in Europe. What I did is take a lot of the questions in those surveys, I repeated that in this survey as well. So, one of the results, you see here the uh, European Union uh, survey, this, this research I committed in 2014, and then two previous uh, surveys on the, in the US. So the, the Babson group together with other partners in the 2014 and 2013. And you see that there's a lot of difference between the US and Europe. In the US, the, the number of institutions that has MOOC offerings or is planning to have a MOOC is about 14%. In this survey, that is biased, it's almost more than 70%. It's having a MOOC or planning a MOOC. We said, 15% in the United States and 70% in, in Europe, that has to be a bias. Let's look again. In the US, it has decreased from 14.3% to 13.6%. So a decrease. So that was the Chronicle Higher Education stating with a graph, the hype is, uh, uh, is over, uh, the MOOC is fading away, etc. In Europe, the AOA did have a study and they said in their study that 85% uh, uh, of their response said they, will have, they have a MOOC or they are planning to have a MOOC. So that's already a large difference with the US. In the survey we did, it was more than 70%. And if you look at this figure from the European scorecard, it's a well-known website, and know, you know about it, it's the Open Education Europa. They have a European MOOCs card, score, scoreboard. You see in the top line the number of MOOCs worldwide, and you see in the bottom the number of MOOCs in Europe. 
The number of MOOCs worldwide is not increasing very much. The number of MOOCs in Europe is increasing even farther, further every month. So we see a lot of new MOOCs coming up in Europe and not in the United States. But there is a bias. In the US, the bias is to large institutions. In the way study, it's biased to those institutions that are in favor for e-learning. And in our study, it's biased to those institutions that are interested in MOOCs. So there is a bias. For example, to illustrate the bias, this is the MOOC scoreboard in Europe. And you see a lot of MOOCs not in Eastern Europe. If you look at the response in our survey, no institutions responded in Eastern Europe. So that again, illustrating the bias in our survey, it's mainly those institutions that are interested in MOOCs that are responding. Looking in more detail, these are the, the survey kind of characteristics uh, of those um, uh, uh, surveys. The US is a very big one, and the total institutions responded is more than 2,000, 2,800. And the AOA study and our study, they are very low numbers. So that's also about reali reliability, etc. But I like to focus on the institutions answering MOOC questions. So not about trends, Europe more developing MOOCs than in the United States, but focusing on the reasons why MOOCs are important. Then the US, they have about 400 institutions replying on MOOCs. And the AOA in our study, we have about 200 and the other 76 kind of res institutions responding. So let's focus not on the only the trend, but also the reasons why institutions are involved in MOOC or not. But first, in discussion, in those surveys, they are asking all kinds of questions on MOOCs. But in each survey, MOOCs are not defined. So the institution can self decide for themselves, yes, we are offering a MOOC or not. So that's another bias. It's a bias for all the surveys, because its MOOCs are not defined beforehand, before the, the survey itself. So we already know this figure. Every letter in MOOC, massive, open, online, and course, is negotiable. It's not defined very good. And here is a table of all the abbreviations of all kinds of MOOCs or related to MOOCs. Not only SPOCs, you have MOOCs with, an, with only a micro uh, course, a SOC, a DOC, LOOC, MORE, ROC. Now, you can do, name it. The abbreviations is only increasing. But also making a difference between what's a course and a minor, minor course, what's a small private open course, and what's a MOOC course. So they're all marketing efforts, so it's only marketing. And in Europe we try to define a MOOC definition. And I didn't try it by myself, I did try to work together with all the European MOOC projects to define what's a MOOC and what's not a MOOC. Because if you have a project on a MOOC and MOOC is not defined, your project is ill-defined as well. So this is a definition, it's also validated in the, in the survey itself. Um, it's a little bit different from the, the Wikipedia definition. Um, the main aspect is that it is designed for large numbers of participants. So the scalability is there, designed for large numbers. It can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, as long as you have the internet connection. So it's mainly online, or almost online. It's open to anyone, everyone without entry qualifications. So that doesn't mean that there's no prior knowledge, but no entry qualifications. It's an open door policy. And it offers a full, complete course experience online for free. In the latest discussions on the MOOC definition, there are two other definitions who say for free or for a little amount of money. Yeah, then it becomes, then it's all courses you can do. And there are even, say, oh, we have some, some video and, and we have an... an, an, an um, a community, and we let's call it a MOOC. 
So no, it's a full course. A full course means more than open educational resources, educational resources like video or PowerPoint. It does has to have a feedback mechanism. It has to have tests. It has to have an exam. It has to have a formal certificate and an enter certificate, not a formal. It can be an informal certificate. So it has to be a full cool, cool, a course experience, and that's very essential. Also essential is that it has to be designed for large numbers. What do you mean by large numbers? So it has to be scalable. So I have a discussion with, for example, with, with, with my colleagues in Delft. They do a great job on MOOCs. But if I ask to them, what happens if your, your, your number of, of participants is increased from 1,000 to 10,000? Does that increase the amount of efforts by your institution a lot or not? Is it linear or is it not linear? Is it not relevant how much if it's 10,000 or 100,000? So it's also about scalability. Now then, you can have a, lot, have a lot of discussion what's a MOOC and what's what not a MOOC. You can find in the report also the validation of that definition. So I, in that report, in the survey, we also asked a lot of institutions, what is your perception of a MOOC? So not giving a definition beforehand, but we ask the institutions replying, what is your perception of what's important in a MOOC? And you see that it's designed for a massive audience is an essential aspect for those institutions that responded to be in a MOOC. The sustainable model, it doesn't have to be. You can lose money with a MOOC and make money elsewhere. Um, on the, the left side, you see that the MOOCs has to be for free. So the blue one, they find it highly relevant. The yellow finds it still re relevant for the institution. So, don't go in detail for this. What's surprising for me was also the importance of open licensing. So you don't see many MOOCs that's an open licensing of content that you can reuse it. Some of the institutions find that relevant. Um, what I want to say in, is in this one, there's a difference between definitions on MOOCs. <coughs> if MOOCs should have a fixed starting date and a fixed pace, or should be self-paced as well. <coughs> So, can self-paced MOOCs uh, courses be a MOOC or not? And we had a lot of dispute with the, the MOOC scoreboard uh, in Europe, why they excluded two years ago all kind of self-paced courses. Even if they are designed for the massive audience, if they are for free, have a full course, etc., they excluded self-paced courses. Lately, Coursera started with self-paced courses. So, it's, for me, it's not an critical element to decide if it's a MOOC or not a MOOC. It's a MOOC because it's for free, it's scalable, it's a full course experience, it has an open door policy, etc. That are the criteria, and not if it's fixed date or not. And this also, you see that the institutions are not decisive. It can be, it can be not, we don't know. And for me, it's not essential. It can be self-paced, it cannot. And there is a difference because you see a lot of dropouts with self, this and fixed schedule of MOOCs, that can be because it's a fixed schedule. You have to be in the pace of six weeks and have to repeat that. So in self-paced, you have the freedom of your own pace, but that's a disadvantage as well, because you don't have to stick behind you to complete it. So it's both sides of the medal, it can be good, can be bad for both sides, but it's not essential for a MOOC. Um, no, I will skip this one. You can find, in, uh, find the definition of the MOOCs, but also the, the, um, the it's in the, in the brochure itself, in the report. You can find uh, the complete criteria, not only the definition, but also the criteria when it's a MOOC and not a MOOC. For example, for the massive, we refer to two criteria. The number of participants is larger than no, 150, that was already stated two years ago by Stephen Downs, I suppose, or was it someone else? But the Dumbass number, so it has to be larger than 150. But most essential, the, uh, the model, and I say the pedagogical kind of, of the model, is designed such that all services do not increase significantly as the number of participants increase. So it's scalable. So that kind of criteria you find in the, in the definition as well, related to openness, online, and on the course level. 
So most of the European projects I talk about, not all, because some started, are accepting this kind of de definition. Going back, let's go to the, to the drivers. Mark, if I'm running out of time, you will never know. Eh? So 10 minutes before, then, yeah, five minutes, okay, yeah. Let's go back to the, to the surveys, the four surveys, and focus on the reasons why institutions are involved or are not involved in MOOCs. So not focusing on all the others, it's just the institutions responding to the MOOC questions. And let's focus on the US and the Europe differences. For example, this question was exactly repeated in the survey I did as in the US. And it's about credentials for MOOCs completion will cause confusion about higher education degrees. If you look for example in the United States, in Casera is, is now offering, you have certificates, certificates of completion, certificate of participation, verified, verified certificates, name it. I think there are already 10 names for a kind of certificates. So I agree with a lot of Americans, they say it will cause confusion. But in Europe, our, the institutions replied to in our survey, don't find that. It's not confusion. And we ask also why, and it's related to the European credit transfer system, etc. So we know when it is verified within the bachelor degree, etc. So we have a system for that. So there's no confusion for the institutions responded in our survey. So that's also a large difference between the US and Europe. Another. <coughs> MOOCs are important for institutions to learn about online pedagogy. Again, stressing what future learners are saying. In Europe, most institutions find that very highly relevant for their institution. It's about learning of online didactics and pedagogical approach. In the US, there's a decrease of interest. You see in 2013, more than 40% increase. 2014, less than 30%. So there's a decrease in interest in, in the United States on online didactics and pedagogies. And they find it very interesting and important in Europe. Again, a difference. Another one. This, again, the same questions repeated in the US survey and in the Europe survey. MOOCs are sustainable methods for offering courses. You see a decrease in the United States. US 2013-2014, there's a decrease in agreeing that it's a sustainable method. In Europe, most of the institutions do agree that it's a sustainable method to provide MOOCs. Perhaps not that MOOCs are a sustainable business model at itself, but it's a part of offering to society and having MOOCs. Another one, how well are MOOCs meeting institutions' objectives? Because you start with a MOOC, or you start with a MOOC and then have the objectives, but there are objectives for that. In the US, very minor do already see some meeting of objectives. In Europe, the institutions that responded see that they are meeting some of the objectives of the institutions. Another question, also exactly the same as in the US survey. What are the primary objectives for your institution? There's not all the objectives, what is the most important objective for your institution? And there you see a lot of agreement. So, like I said, it has an increase in institutional visibility. That's important. The most striking difference between the US and Europe is that in the US, it's related to drive student recruitment. Like the Trinity College said, student uh, recruitment is important. But in Europe, we find that it's very important to reach new kind of students. So not recruitment of more students, but to reach new kind of students. And that's also related to create flexible learning opportunities. We want to have flexible learning opportunities, not only for the on-campus students or more on-campus students, but for new kind of students. Mike, mind the difference between that, uh, that we also have see the bias that for um, the, in Europe, the institutions that are not offering a MOOC yet, 
the most important interest to be involved in MOOCs is the flexible learning opportunities. We see a large difference between the, all, the response of all institutions and the response in the, in the European Union is only uh, those institutions move offering a MOOC. So the yellow fares, fares as the, the grey one. What's consistent is that the primary objective to generate income or to reduce the cost or explore cost reductions are not seen important, not in the United States, uh, not in Europe. Not seen as the primary objective. They are important, but not the primary objective. So this one from the new vice counselor in the, from the Open University, warning about the loss of part-time uh, part students. I see a relation between this one. So MOOCs is not only for, new, for, for present students of to, for on, on campus supply, but for new students in a flexible way. So MOOCs, uh, there is a lot of po policy efforts here as well. Eh? So there is a the, the funding scheme, etc. Is that uh, feasible for part-time students, etc. But MOOCs can be a solution to continuous professional education and, and part-time students as well. And that's also why Europe is investing in that and why universities are investing in that. We added some, some additional questions in our survey, for example, to the relevance of certain objectives for institutions. So we clustered the, relev uh, the, the kind of the objectives. You see already that there are financial reasons to be involved in MOOCs. They are not important. It's the, on the bottom. Most important is the visibility, the marketing, etc. These are, those are seen as the most important for institutions. But in Europe, also the innovation area, so to improve your educational offer, to innovate your educational offer, to experiment, etc., is seen very important in Europe, as well as the, the demands for learners and societies. So there's no comparison to the US, it's just Europe in this one. So, some reflection on what was happening. In Europe, institutions are more involved in MOOCs than in the US, although there's a bias in my survey. The number of European MOOC institutions with uh, MOOC involvement increasing. The MOOCs are perce perceived in Europe as a massive of offering course, in their complete, not as a course level, but in the total offer. And uh, institutions are increasingly and developing a positive attitude towards MOOCs and have positive experience. So they are meeting some of their institutional objective with MOOCs. The most dominant objective is to increase institutional visibility and having MOOCs for re re reputation issues. But in the US, the recruitment is seen as an, uh, as, as a student recruitment is seen as the most important objective. In, the, in the Europe, it's seen as more new students and flexible learning opportunities. Then I want to ask, but why is that? Why is the difference? Why is that? Why are we in Europe more interested in new kind of students, flexible learning opportunities in the US on a different way? What are the macro drivers, the drivers on, on an institutional or society level that are most important? And perhaps it's difficult to read, we identified about nine or ten different macro drivers that are important for at, at an institutional or even as a society level. And you see at the top that being involved in, an, in education as a big business or reducing the cost are not that important as a driver itself. Uh, the rest are relative, seen as relative important, uh, all kinds of drivers that are relevant for to be involved with MOOCs as an institution. Except, for example, the, at the last one, the shared services and, and, and unbundling. By unbundling, I mean is that with MOOCs, all kinds of services are outsourced. Even exams, like the Pearson exam centers, where the exam itself is outsourced, not only the platform, etc. So that is about unbundling your services to, not only into your own institution, but to out parties who are offering those services. If you looked at, at the, uh, uh, we asked the same question to the, to the CEOs of the institutions and then asked 
what is in your opinion the macro drivers for the government? So the governmental influence, so what's there most important? And you see that um, the need for skills for jobs, uh, the quality aspect and the internationalization, globalization are seen by universities as the main reason why governments should be involved. To summarize this on the macro level, on the macro level the institutions say that is relevant or highly relevant almost all the drivers except for new methods and big business like education, reducing the costs and the unbundling. If you ask the same question on what's the most important for your government, the most important in for your government are the need for skills and jobs, improving the quality for learning and the internationalization, globalization aspects. You find also the all kinds of description of the, the macro drivers are in the report as well. So, let's reflect on this and the difference between the US and Europe. Why are there those differences? So, we, you see the difference that the US dominates the MOOC world both by funding raised, by the, uh, uh, both by the big bet platforms, and there are differences in the objectives. This is an article in The Economist of two weeks ago, and it states that it there are in, 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 in worldwide there are two kinds of systems for higher education. The American system and the European system. And in the American system, uh, it's, it's based on a mixed private and public funding and it's related to, to, to excellence uh, of, of an institution. Well, in Europe, each institution gets more or less the same money from the government. So, for example, in the Netherlands, there are no bad universities and most of the universities are even good in the top 100 ranking of the Shanghai index etc. So the global system, the global system is divided in the American system based on competition, reputation, mixed funding against the more social dimension in Europe and uh, where all the university gets more or less the same funding from the, uh, from the government. They analyze it that the American system is not related to educational output it's only related to research output, it's about having high fees, how high the fee, how better your reputation, and how more, et etc. et cetera. So it's about competition, high fees, it's not related to educational output. And they say the American system is worldwide winning. So yeah, that said, okay, what's on the European system? Is there a European system, or is the diversity between our countries so big that because in the UK you have to pay 8,000 pounds for, or even more now, for uh, per year for a student? Yes. Seven, uh, so seven or 8,000 pounds, yeah. One minute, not five. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, therefore we decided to have a conference last year in November in Porto to, to, to reflect on the European dimension and we make a Porto Declaration, and the, the Porto Declaration on European MOOCs. Well, what's important for Europe? Because we are more involved, if you see only for example on the Coursera platform, I said that, I think that Chef Haywood last, from Edinburgh uh, lastly demonstrated that the number of MOOCs on the Coursera platform is now more than 50% is European. So in Europe we are dominating the, 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 the MOOC world. In, 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 both in increasing the objectives are indeed related to social dimension there's a lot of efforts going on but diversity we have a lot of platforms related to one country one language we have a lot of projects not working together so that's essential to have a cohesive and a collaborative effort in Europe the main challenge is how to do that So this is my last slide. So last, last week I was with the European Commission and I said the strength of Europe is diversity. And they said that's the weakness of Europe, diversity. So yeah, what's it? Because we have a lot of languages. Try to develop a, a European platform with all the languages and all the diversity in pedagogical approach as well. You cannot do that. But the strength is that diversity 
is perhaps the slow pass, but is the more sustainable pass. Like with biology or even evolution, diversity is to embrace the diversity in, in tackling the problem on the social dimension, working together, respecting differences, and then trying to, 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 to make step by step further in our efforts on the social dimension in education. So therefore I say, let's embrace diversity, but then let's work hard together to collaborate on uh, the issues that are important. Thank you. has been pointed out around MOOCs in Europe is of course the a strength that we have is the ECTS, the European Credit yeah. Transfer System, yeah. which is a huge asset that Europe has and I just noticed one of the MOOCs, I think it's from the EU project, and uh, UNED are giving out a uh, UNED gas certificate for, yeah. for credit, yeah. Uh, yeah. for ECTS credits at the end of it, so, um, and in light of the ASU um, announcement, it's a very much watch this space. Um, the, you mentioned the Porto Declaration there as well, and the Porto MOOCs conference, um, and there is going to be a special edition on MOOCs of the uh, International Review of Open and Distance, Open and Distributed, they yeah. renamed themselves over the road, um, International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. We have a paper coming out yes. on this topic with yeah. myself, and yourself, and Mark, and other members of the yeah. Public and score projects. And th that article is stressing about the threats and opportunities of, of, uh, for Europe in the MOOCs world. So that will be published, I hope, in the next few months. Yeah. 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 It's been edited by Marcus, guest edited by Marcus Diamond, and it should be of yeah. interest to those as we are active in the, this research area. Um, I don't know if we have time maybe for one quick question while we uh, transition into our debate now, because we're going to. Um, get some um, of our speakers back up and some others and um, have them really thrash it out here in a minute. <laughs> Maybe a quick so, question. Uh, so we, yeah, we have probably sorry. time for a, a comment or a question for Darko. Colin, yeah? Um, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that the spend on higher education is increasing worldwide. Um, and yet, across the surveys, uh, 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 the, the, the use of MOOCs in the reduction of the provision cost of education was not seen as important in any of the uh, sort of questions. Mm -hmm. Was that because institutions choose not uh, to, to use it as a uh, method of reducing cost of education? Um, so there's a difference between the primary objective for institutions. So cost might be important because it's about scalability, but it's not a primary objective to be involved. And there is more on innovation or the social dimension that are most important, etc. Or learning about pedagogical approach. Um, your first part of the question was related to the Economist article I said, and that was on the, and, uh, at the bottom is staying. Yeah. Yes, but that's also the social dimension. I think that we will talk about in a panel as well. You see, the increase in spending is mostly not in the U.S. and Europe, but outside in Asia and Latin America, etc. So, in the people where the, the increase for need for higher education is very high, and then MOOCs can provide a solution for that. Can, but are not yet. So, yeah. Um. Thanks very much. And just to say, Darko is here over lunch before he flies back, so he'll yeah. be able to take any questions yes, and, thank you. and continue the conversation further. Yeah. And just like to thank you again, Darko. Thank you. Uh, give this oh. <laughs>